Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, welcome to JHipster, EC Microservices with JHipster. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm Sandal Kumaran. I'm a full stack developer at Zibia Labs, where we actually do uh, a complete release orchestration as well as deployment automation tools. So if you are interested and if it rings a bell for you guys, we have a booth outside, you can go ahead there and check it out. I'm also a code dev team member at Webpack. Sorry, at JHipster, and a team member at Webpack. And I'm also part of Rust Vasm working group. How many of you here know about Rust? Vasm? Hey, we have one. OK, Vasm, WebAssembly, anybody hear about it? You can run your native code in the browser. WebAssembly helps you to do that. So we are doing an uh, integration between Rust and Rust WebAssembly. So we decide the future of how it is going to work. And I'm a big open source lover, and you can see me in many open source projects. I tend to contribute many places. Finally, I also authored a book on full stack development with JHipster, uh, where we describe whatever the things that you know need to know for a full stack developer, how hard it is to be a full stack developer. How many of you guys are full stack developers here? OK. How many of you enjoy being that? <laughs> OK. We have one. Yay. OK. So yeah, and also uh, the monolith and the microservices application, how you're going to migrate towards it and how you're going to do it, those kind of stuff we have discussed in this book. And if you are interested, you can buy it out. And anybody who has Twitter here, so you can reach me out at Sandil Kumaran uh, for any questions regarding JHipster or any open source project that I contribute to. OK, cool. How many of you are doing front end here, Angular, Angular developers? One, two, three, four, okay. React developers? Two, okay. How many of you use Webpack here? Okay, very few. How many of you enjoy using it? <laughs> Great. And uh, how many of you feel like the front end technologies are changing and it's very hard to keep it up? Wow, okay, we have a lot of hands here. Great. <laughs> okay. Moving towards the back end, how many of you are pure core back end developers? And how many of you of them are using Spring Suit? Almost everybody who raised their hand. And uh, how many of you are using microservices in your application? One, two, three. Oh, wow, we get a good number of people here. And how many of you use Netflix here? Netflix OSS? Few. And what do you do for other things, like for microservices? Anybody using Consul? Nobody using console? OK, great. So all those who raise their hands for microservices, how you're deploying your stuffs? Sorry? Jenkins. Jenkins? Perfect. What else? OK. Do you guys enjoy it? OK. The script that you're writing for Jenkins, do you guys enjoy it? No? OK. Great, and there are a lot of different deployments here, CD pipelines that we have, but everything, most of the times, they are boilerplate stuff, and you have to rewrite them for every project. Kind of just change here and there, which makes it really hard, but sometimes it will work, and sometimes it will not work. Of course, it's most of the time it will not work. So what is JHipster? How anybody here used JHipster before? One, two, three, enjoyed it? Okay. So this guy over here is Jay Hipster, and uh, he's the elder one. We do have an Angular version of it. This is this guy. The difference between these two is the one having Angular tattoo, the other one is having React tattoo. That's it. Greetings from Java Hipster. So we do generate. So what do you do? We do generate an application. We are in GitHub. We are a completely open source project. So we have more than 10K plus GitHub stars. We have more than 420 contributors. Amazing contributors, I should say. And if you guys are interested, you can come ahead and contribute too. And uh, this is one of the most difficult questions that I use to answer for every people after my talk, because they will come and say, OK, the application is generated really quickly, but how many of the companies are using it? Like, uh, I've personally implemented more than 30 application, enterprise production-ready application with JHipster. And also, there are more than 200 plus companies that are using JHipster in their companies. And they have come and registered in our website. You can go ahead to our website and check how many companies are using what they are using. And this is just an NPM stuff. We have 13K plus weekly downloads. And this is one of the main things that I want to highlight it. Like, uh, anybody know there is a Sonar Cube project 
for rating the open source as a quality. We have one, two, three, yeah. So yeah, uh, so JHipster uh, has been rated as a top project for the for a few days, for a few months, you can say. But now we are moving faster towards JHipster 5. That's why our test coverage is kind of low. It's like 84%, but we generally used to have it more than 90%. And one thing to note here is we generate more than 40K plus lines of code in a sample application. And also there was some research has been done and we, uh, they estimated like in JHipster you can generate 20 to 6,000 varieties of application with JHipster. That's a huge number. So what do, do JHipster do? We are basically an application generator with Spring Boot plus Angular or React. We do provide an option to generate monolith or microservices or UAA. So you have a monolithic application, you can generate with JHipster, and then you can generate microservices with JHipster. And uh, in microservices, we took an opinionated approach, like we are using proxy-based microservices. Uh, I'll explain how it does work, but we are using gateway or proxy-based microservices. And then you do have UAA. How many of you know UAA here? Okay, UAA is User Authorization and Authentication Service, which just kind of helps to authorize and authenticate user. You can generate the JHipster itself. So why microservices? So we have quite a few hands raised up. So why microservices? Why do you think microservices are essential? The silence means somebody asked you to do that. Quicker, Quicker? okay. Then? Sorry? Scalability. scalability, okay. Do you enjoy scalability of microservices? Yes, okay, brave answer, yeah, okay. So few things to note here is like, it helps you to in develop independently. It's like you can segregate the modules and then it helps you to develop something independently, completely. And also it does help you to deploy them independently, which is also an amazing thing. And there is one more thing like fault isolation. How many of you use this fault isolation part of microservices? We have one or two hands here. Yeah, so it helps you to isolate certain application part if it is not working correctly, which is essential in this world because you have one surface that is not working properly. Because of that, your user's entire perception of your application doesn't need to go down. So you can isolate these services and then use the other services booting up and using that for that reason. And the other advantage I could say is granular scaling. And there are a lot of different advantages that microservices has, but this is curated list, or my favorite list, you can take it. Uh, so it's a granular scaling. Uh, you can scale your application, as he said, like a part of the application, you can boot it up or scale it up in order uh, that relates to your traffic and all those stuffs. And this is one quote from Martin Fowler, which says, if components do not compose cleanly, then all you're doing is shifting the complexity within the monolith application to the connection between the application, which makes sense for me because you have one single code base and if that has a problem and you move towards a microservices from that area, then you have the problem which is less ex explicit as well as harder to control. So that is one of the main problem areas that we have in microservices. You have to, if you cannot design a microservices well, if you dis cannot design a monolith well, you don't need to go for microservices because you cannot design it well. And the problem that you can fix in monolith is much easier because it is within your single application. But in case of microservices, it's spread across. And you will not know whether it's within your application or between the application or outside components that you have added. So there are certain complexities. So people who are developing microservice application, what is the biggest complexity that you have here? Deployments, of course. Configuration. Configuration, of course. Anything else? <laughs> Starting new wow, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. Okay. Okay, I will not say this is a complexity here, but it's like you need to add some extra components to your application, which is again a boilerplate code, but you need to add those things inside your application. For example, service registries. Anybody knows about service registry here? Okay, service registry helps you to register and deregister your services as they come up and go down because in microservices world, everything is flaky. Consider that everything is flaky. All your services can come up or go down whatever time it needs to be. So when you, when you have that kind of a dynamic environment, you need someone to register this. You need someone to record this stuff and this service registry will help you to do that. Am I audible? Audible? Am I audible? 
Okay, fine, thanks. And uh, you need to have health checkers for your application, which basically tells, okay, this guy is working good. This guy is everything fine. You need these kind of components added inside your application. So these are the highly available components that you need to add into your application, not just your application. So you need to worry about two more things here. And deployments, of course, is the biggest complexity that we have. And other thing is, immediately you say to your team that, OK, we are going for microservices. Everybody expects, like almost 99.999% people expect that you should have this much availability. And it's like something unwritten rule in microservices that people always tend to expect. If you go to microservices, they always tend to expect this kind of availability with you, which is kind of difficult to provide. And also, you need to add much more highly available components to the application which increases the bandwidth or which increases the amount of work that you have to do, amount of boilerplate code that you have to do. So here, so adding highly available services and a lot of moving parts inside the microservices without any clear separation or clear plan that you have will, be decrease, will decrease your productivity and also it is highly error prone. And it adds a lot of boilerplate code to your application. So let's discuss what kind of architecture the jhipster provides to you. And then let's go ahead and generate a jhipster-based microservice application, try to deploy it in jhipster Kubernetes if everything goes well, goes into cloud, and then we access the application via the cloud. So the architecture, basically what we have is gateway-based architecture. So we have a list of browsers. I guess I have IE inside here. So anybody still supporting IE6? OK, no worry. OK, you're all living good life then. So you have this gateway application, which is the main endpoint for your application. So this is where your entire user interface works. So all your requests that you're sending through gateway will be sent through gateway, and then it goes and accesses a microservices application that is running behind it. So which means all the microservices application will not have any UI to it. So there is one single point for you guys to have a UI. And it obviously has Angular or React component, so you can use Angular or React, not AND. And then you have Zool. Zool helps you to proxy this uh, request and response, and then it sends to the underlying microservices application that you have. Added to that, you have user authentication and stuff like that, which helps you to add a role to your user and then configure everything based on the role. And at the back end, you have n number of microservices. We call it as microservices application in jhipster. And added to that, you can use any of the two registries that we have. One is console, and the other one is jhipster registry. And there are actually uh, advantages of using both. While console is an agent that gets added to all the microservice application, which means each and every microservices that you have will have an agent, console agent running. On the other hand, jhipster registry is a single standalone program, which actually centralized, and it, uh, it will work on the centralized. All the services it is getting booted up, it goes and talks to the jhipster registry, says, OK, boss, I'm ready. You can send my request. And jhipster registry will register all those stuffs, and it will try to send the request that you're sending in to those particular things which are alive. On the other hand, we also have jhipster console. jhipster console is nothing but an Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana-based component. So how many of you guys use ELK stack? Yes. Do you guys enjoy that? Yeah. OK. We have a good number of enjoyment here. Good. So yeah, so uh, we have this ELK stack, which is uh, running. And Kibana will give you nice dashboards. And we do have a set of pre-configuration stuff, which helps you to get up and running. So this is a Docker image again. So can you go ahead and use it? On the other hand, the console and jhipster registry, both are available as a Docker images. You can go ahead and use it straight away. Perfect. And the other pain point that we have is deployments. So in jhipster, we do support this many deployments. Like you have a Docker files that are generated when the application is generated. You can go ahead and generate Kubernetes configuration file, which helps you to run Kubernetes and then move this thing entirely into Kubernetes cluster out of the box. And it also have Heroku-based configuration. You can start, uh, you can run Heroku, you can, dev, uh, you can create the jhipster application and then deploy them in Heroku. And also, you have a bunch of other cloud vendors, and uh, we have support for them. And one cool thing about this is all those vendors that you're seeing here, like Kubernetes, for example, or OpenShift, for example, the entire configuration was written by the people who are actually working on their team, which makes it much more great. 
and also it is following all the patterns and all these standards, all the best practices, which means it's much easier for us to do it. Okay, cool. It's a demo time now. Okay, as a part of this demo, I'll create a gateway application, I'll create a microservice application, and then I'll uh, run it on locally, and then I'll try to push it to Kubernetes in GCP and try to run it from there, okay? So first, I'm going to make a directory here. Is everything is visible? Or you, want, you guys want to zoom it in a little bit? <coughs> Fine. OK, great. So first, I'll create an application gateway. So let us call it as app gateway. <coughs> and let's go inside the application, and then to generate an application, it's nothing but you just type jhipster command. So I'm currently in 5.0.0 beta, so we are going to release version 5 sooner. And uh, the first question it asks, it asks you a bunch of questions, and you have just have to answer it. Based on that, it generates application for you. So the first question it asks is whether you have to generate a monolith or a microservice application or a microservice gateway. And the other option that we saw is UAA. So here, I'm going to generate a microservice gateway application. Let me select it. And then it asks, what is the base name of your application? Let's do something like DevOps UK 2018. And then it asks, like, uh, which port you have to run. So let's go ahead and select 8080, which is the default stuff. And also the default Java package name, all the basic things. And the discussion is very important because it asks you what kind of registry that you have to use. Uh, we have two options here, jhipster registry as well as console. Uh, we have seen what are the advantages of using them both. The JH registry in turn has Eureka and Spring Cloud Config inside it. And you can also select no service discovery, which means you have to plug in your own service discovery inside. So if you have any different service discovery that is available and you are using it in your, system, in your company organization, you can go ahead and use it. But for this demo, I'll choose JH registry. And we have three different types of authentication which you can use. It's JWT or Auth2 or UA server authentication. So let's go ahead and select JWT. And then it asks you for the database information. And we do support SQL and NoSQL databases. Uh, Spring, we use Spring Data JPA internet, which means like most of the SQL database support are inbuilt with Spring Data JPA. But we do have custom wrappers for Cassandra or MangoDB for that. We do have a custom wrappers which we use in order to write the queries. So we'll select SQL, we'll select MySQL here. And then for development, how many of you guys have used H2 database here? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, great. So H2 is really helpful in doing the development purpose because you can create those databases. It's in memory, so you just go and go ahead and delete those stuffs if you don't want to do it. It's really helpful, so it creates it. And uh, we use Hibernate second level cache. This is really helpful when you're doing application that runs on multiple or load balanced and things like that. It's really helpful. I'm going to select yes here. And classic question. How many of you use Maven here? Gradle? Oh wow, we have few hands for Gradle. It's surprising. Okay, sure. But yeah, uh, you can go ahead and choose Maven since everybody said Maven. Let me go ahead and select Maven here. And we do have other technologies here, such as like you can add Elasticsearch to your application. You can add Spring WebSocket. To your, how many of you use Spring WebSocket here? Yeah. So with uh, Spring Boot, it's really easier to add a Spring WebSocket. So you can go ahead and add Spring WebSocket. The boilerplate is generated for you. And also you can say like, you, I want an API first development. How many of you know about API first development here? One, two, three, okay. So it's really good thing to know about it, like API first development, jhipster kind of supports API first development, which means you can have an API, so you can hit the APIs and get the responses from that. So it's kind of like, it helps you to generate your application and then expose this thing outside. We do have Swagger code gen for that, which helps you to do that stuff. And we do have Kafka support. So for this demo, I'm not going to select anything, but we do have multiple options like this. And uh, it asks you for the which front-end framework we use. Uh, we live on the bleeding edge, so let's go ahead and select React here. Uh, it's in beta, so fingers crossed. But I'm going to select React here. We do have Angular 5. Angular 6 pull request is open. We are on the verge of merging it. Probably you'll have it Angular 6 in a few days. And then it asks for any SaaS support. And then we do have I18N support, which means like we have 29 different languages. You can go ahead and select different languages from here. And also added to that, we also 
provide additional testing frameworks, uh, which helps you to test your application. We have Gatling. How many of you have used Gatling here? OK, we have a good few hands there. OK, so Gatling, we also generate Gatling files for the uh, application that is generated by default. And also, we do have Cucumber-based support, Cucumber-based test cases. And we do have a marketplace where you can publish your modules. And with that module, you can go ahead and run the generator, trigger the generator, and make a difference. Like, we have a module called um, Ignite Hipster, which creates a React Native component. Like, it creates a React Native application instead of a standard web application. We do have Ionic JHipster, which helps you to create Ionic-based Angular application that runs on your mobile. So once you have done it, what it does is creates a list of files, and then it runs yarn install. Added to that, it also uh, initializes a Git repository, and it works after that. In the meanwhile, let's go ahead to the next tab and create another, let's call it as app service. Let's go inside app service and then run the same jhipster command. So here I'm going to ge okay, I'm sorry. Okay, here I'm going to generate a microservice application which doesn't have UI in it. And then I let me name it like okay, app service. And then it runs on port 8081 in order to avoid the conflict. And the same package name, I use the same discovery server that I used before, same authentication mechanism. So here you see it also asks for databases, which means all your microservices, all your services will have its own individual database. And this is what I mean by opinionated approach that we have taken. Like all the services will have their own databases, and it's based on proxy-based pattern. So I'm going to choose the same default things here. And also it asks, like, Spring Cache abstraction is added to your services, which is really helpful. Uh, if you're using in a single node, you can use for eHCache. E On the other hand, if you're using multiple nodes, you can go ahead and use Hassel Cast Cache here. So let me select it. Again, I'm going to add second level cache, which is extremely helpful. And I'm going to use Maven here. And again, you have the set of options. And finally, you get the i18 in support, which is, I'll just select the defaults here. And if you notice, it will not ask about the UI because it will not generate the UI. There will not be any user interface here. And that's it. So it also generates an application. Let's go ahead and see what it has generated. So it's a standard Spring Boot based project. You have nothing fancy inside. It's a Spring Boot based project, which has a web app, which has an entire React application added to it the resources file where you have the configuration and all those stuff. And the Java, entire Java lives here. And uh, you see this is much most important thing that I have to show you. This is the Docker file that has been generated by default in the application. So if you take a look at here, it has a JHipster registry YAML. Is it clear? Can everybody see this? OK, perfect. So we have a JHipster registry YAML, which is nothing but a Docker Compose file, which helps you to boot up the registry server from the image. So we do have an image, JHipster registry, and it boots up the thing. And also, you can specify the volume. You can specify the dev and prod profile. The difference between dev and prod profile is when you specify a prod profile, it goes and takes the configuration from a Git repository. On the other hand, when you say a dev, a dev profile, it takes it from your local repository which is very much helpful in order to do. And you can also spend in the other environment as well as the ports information, whichever you want. And this is the basic app.yaml file. So what it does is it helps you to generate the entire application. It helps you to run the entire application with one single command. You can go ahead and say docker compose, and then say uh, hyphen f this file, and then say app, which means your entire microservices has been built redeployed or developed or deployed. Everything happens with one single command, and you can go ahead and access those things, which is really helpful because if people who are doing microservices will understand the difficulty of stopping one service, restarting the other service, and all those stuff. Docker Compose really helps you to do that, and we do generate application Docker Compose file by default. It also, you can see, it also has the database embedded in it. It also has the registry embedded in it, which is basically what it does. It just goes ahead and starts all those three things. Yes, yeah. We have our application generated. So let's go ahead and run event W. Let's 
let's boot up this application. So you can see initially the application will start fail because we don't have jgipster registry running. The service discovery is not running. So let's go ahead and start the service discovery too. To start the service discovery, it's docker compose hyphen f. You go to any of the file. Let's go to app service. Let's go to src main docker. And then I just go ahead here and then deploy only the micro registry and then say app. So this will boot up the uh, jhipster registry. OK, it boots up the jhipster registry, and then it runs there, because I have my jhipster registry already running. So it tries to reattach everything. So now you can see it throws a series of exception, because my jhipster registry is getting restarted. So it detects that, and it shows uh, throws a lot of exception, because uh, your once application has been started, it starts to send all the heartbeat to the jhipster registry. So once the jhipster registry is up, it's up now. So let's go ahead and see. So this is jhipster registry. So you can see here, now both the application has been connected to the jhipster registry. You can see the application that has connected and up. And you can see the system status. And this registry is mainly for admins or the operation side of the users who wanted to see how the system is behaving and what are the components of the system is there and how many versions or instances of the system that are available. You can also go ahead and see the configuration, whatever the system has, the instances that it is running. So you have app servers, the DevOps UK, which is a gateway. And this is a app service, the DevOps uh, microservice application. Added to that, you can go ahead and see the metrics of the application, the entire metrics, how the jhipster registry itself is working. And you have a drop down here, which lists down how the different applications are working. The application that are connected to the jhipster registry, what is the health of it, how the metrics are captured. You can see the application metrics, their HTTP request, and also the service statistics, like how your services are behaving. All those things are default generated for you. Sorry. And also you have the health checks, which list down the health of a different parts of the application. And everything here runs based on the uh, uh, Spring Boot actuators. So every uh, all since both the application, all the applications are Spring Boot, it goes and hits with the actuators, and then it gets the data from the actuators and lists down beautifully for you here. And we do have this API. So here, this API is responsible for API first development, you can see. So here it gives us complete Swagger UI, which helps you to find out all the requests that are available as part of this services, as well as for the child services. And also it helps you to give an option to try out. You can go ahead and try out with CURL, or you can go ahead and do all those stuff here. And you can also specify the application. So once you, you go to the application, it lists down all the application level Swagger UI, which means you have one stop place where you can go ahead and see all the rest endpoints of your application are working correctly which is another cool thing that you have here. And added to that, you have this logs. You can go ahead and see the logs of different application. So it helps you to see the logs of different application that are running. And uh, also you have this loggers, which helps you to define the loggers on runtime, which is another cool Spring Boot feature. You can go ahead and define the loggers at the runtime. So our application is also on. So let's go ahead and run our application, localhost. So this is a React-based application that is generated. So far, we have seen an Angular-based application. And this is a React-based application. So here, uh, let me go ahead and log in. Same admin admin password. So once you have logged in here, so you have a list of things here. So you have a gateway page, which shows a list of services that it connects to. So this page will show you the microservice application that it is, has connected to. Added to that, you do have entire user management, the metrics, everything is available because I logged in as an admin. And you do have a role-based approach here. So we, the by default, we generate this for users. And if you want to connect with any third-party system like Okta or Keyclock, you can go ahead and do it. It's, uh, you, have you have to select OAuth2 authentication there. Once you have selected that, you can go ahead and do it. But how many of you are using OAuth2 authentication here? Two, three, four, five. 
yeah. So you can go ahead and by default it's generated with you. So you just have to configure a few things like the endpoints that you have to define. But after the apart from that, it's ready for you. So that's it. We have developed a microservice application much more easily and started them in local. And also we can do the stuff. Now what we are going to do is we have to push these things into cloud with JHipster Kubernetes. So how do you do it? To do that, let me stop this application. Actually, you don't need to stop, but I'm just stopping it. OK, I'll let me go back here, one level. And then I create a folder called Gates. Anybody knows what is Gates here? <laughs> OK, so uh, let me go ahead and select Gates. I'm in the correct one. OK. And then I go ahead and type jhipster Kubernetes. How many of you are using Kubernetes in production now? Two, three, four. OK. How many of you want to move to Kubernetes? One, two, three. Great. Cool. OK. So once you start a Kubernetes, it expects Docker to be installed in your machine. So it first checks for the Docker. And once it is done, then it asks what kind of application for which you have to produce a configuration file. And we are doing with microservice application. Let's go ahead and select microservices. And then it asks, what is the root directory that you want to send, uh, that you have your applications running? So we select the default uh, root directory that is just one level behind. So here you have two services that has been generated now. First one is a gateway, the other one is an app service. So both the services are listed here. So you can go ahead and select these two. And then it asks whether you want to do additional monitoring options here. So what are the additional monitoring options that we have? Is we have one option called ALK plus Zipkin. How many of you use Zipkin here? One, one person. OK. And you do have another option uh, called Prometheus. Uh, how many of you use Prometheus or heard about it? OK. Few hands. OK. So you have options to select between uh, Zipkin and ELK or between uh, Micro Prometheus. So if you want, you can select for this demo purpose. Let me go ahead and go with no here. And it asks you for the default password. Please don't give admin here, but you can change any encrypted password. But I'm just giving admin. And then the namespace of Kubernetes, again, default is not recommended. It's default, but you have to change it. And it asks for your base Docker repository name, because how it works is like it creates a Docker image out of it, Docker image out of your application, and pushes this Docker image to the cloud, your Docker repository. And from there, Kubernetes will take the application and run it. So it needs to know the repository name. So let me give it my repository name. And then what amount, what information, like how do you want to push? What is the command that you need to push it? You can use Docker push, or you can even use uh, kubectl stuff. Like uh, gcloud comes with its own push command. You can use that in order to push it. Or else many of the cloud providers nowadays are giving their own push commands. You can go ahead and use them. But let's use the default one, Docker push here. And the next question it asks is uh, whether you want to go for a load balancer, node port, or ingress. How many of you know the difference between these three? One, two, OK. So uh, let me briefly touch that part. So a uh, load balancer is like, it helps you to create a load balanced IP. So you can go ahead and hit, expose this IP, and you can go ahead and hit this IP and work on it. On the other hand, node port, it's like, it kind of randomizes the port and uses this random port for you. On the, uh, at last, you have ingress, which actually ingresses for your service, which means you cannot directly expose the external IP. You cannot go ahead and hit the expose, exposed IP. There will not be any IP exposed. You cannot go ahead and straight away access them from the outside world. So those are three options that you have. Let's go ahead and select the default one of load balancer. That's it. So you have your Kubernetes files that has been generated. And also, it gives you a set of commands which you have to run in order to make create images and then push those images into a single place. So let's go ahead and do this stuff. And just before we do, we have to create build. So let's go ahead and create a production build. So let me go inside the gateway and then create a production build. This might take a while. And then let me go inside the app service and then create a production. 
So what this command will do is this command will help you to generate uh, a Docker image, and then it helps you to create this Docker image and have it ready. After that, you can, it will tag the Docker image and it will be ready. After that, you can push it to your Docker repository, which we will see in a while. But just before that, we'll go ahead and see what is the file that has been generated. So inside K8, you have three different folders that has been generated. The first folder, this one is for your gateway application. And this one is for your app service, your microservice application. And this is for your registry, jhipster registry, since you have chosen. If you have chosen jhipster console, then we also generate a console Docker image. And it has ELK stack embedded in it, so which means you don't need to configure anything extra for that. So let's go ahead and see what it has generated. So it is a Kubernetes file. So you have this YAML file, and uh, it says uh, the API version, all the metadata information, the names of the application. It also adds the labels. And it says, like, initializing the containers part. How many of you have done Kubernetes YAML file? One, two. <coughs> OK, so it's kind of your Docker Compose file, but with more options and more commands added into it, which makes it really easier. And few things to note here is like this entire structure, if you take, it's kind of like similar to what you have it in Docker Compose file, but added to that, you have this image pull policy, which means if you don't have an image that is available, you can pull it from somewhere, like from the Docker registry that you have defined. So that is the reason why it asks the Docker registry, like the username of Docker registry, it has to pull the image from that registry. And we had a cool talk from today from Stephen stating that this memory is not needed. It's much more higher. But yeah, it's developed by a Google engineer, which means, of course, it happens. <laughs> if you want, you can reduce the memory. I have some free credits left, so I can use it. And uh, uh, it, uh, since it's a uh, gateway support web-based application, which means it exposed in the port of 8080, and it's a port, we define a port, and give it a name, which means which makes it as a web application itself. And these two commands are the really good ones, uh, readiness probe and liveness probe. Uh, the readiness probe is something like it checks your application whether it's ready to access, ready to serve, uh, or it is ready. On the other hand, liveness probe will tell you the application is live. That is, it's living. It's, uh, its heartbeat is still ticking out. And what it does is, if you take a look at here, it's self-explanatory. You have an HTTP GET command at this endpoint, and this port as a web, which means this is a port that we are talking about. And it says, like, delay for 20 seconds. Once your application gets started, you wait for 20 seconds. And for every 15 seconds, you check whether the application is ready. You check whether the application is working correctly. And finally, you have a failure threshold of six. So if it automatically gets, uh, like, six failure requests, then it will shut down the server and recreate another pod for you, which is really, really good stuff. And the other one is this liveness probe, which helps you to check your application whether it is live. So it checks, like, initially delays for 120 seconds, so we expect our application to get started within 120 seconds. And if you have done some configuration that reduces this thing or increases this thing, you can change it. But you have this 120 seconds, after which it starts to hit your management health endpoint, which is an actuator endpoint, of course, and it tries to check whether the application is live or not. And this is like a basic MySQL stuff. And one thing to note here is like uh, we do uh, generate a MongoDB file, which means we do have a cluster-based MongoDB support, which means we do generate clusters, MongoDB clusters. So if you want to use a MongoDB as a separate single instance that is running, you can go ahead and use it. And if you want to add a cluster of MongoDB, then you can do it right away because we have generated all the default steps for you. It does nothing fancy. It just creates, uh, takes a MySQL image, and then it uh, sets certain information for that image, and then it starts running those images. On the other hand, this DevOps service YAML is a one file that shows, OK, this is the main entry point for the application, and it goes and enters here. And then it says, like, we have this DevOps UK 2018, and we have type load balancer, which we have selected when you are creating the application. And it says, OK, this has a port that is named as web, and the port that is exposing is 8080. Similarly, you have the same structure, but the one difference is 8081, and it doesn't have a new UI, but doesn't make sense for uh, YAML file to do the stuff. So it runs on 8081 port, and it also checks for the same endpoints for the uh, liveness and readiness pro. On the other hand, we have jhipster registry. So this jhipster registry is, of course, the password that you have has been hard-coded, like, I mean, uh, Base64 encoded. 
And uh, this JHipster registry is, of course, a load balance service that we are going to see. There will be two JHipster registries running, which is load balance for high availability. And you need all your service registries or health, disk, uh, health checkers to be highly available because it's essential in part of microservices development. So this is coming by default with a load balanced and two servers will start running. Let's see. Hopefully, both of them might have finished now. Yep, it's success, great. And it's also done. So now what we have to do is, let's go here. No. So let's go to application, let's go and open this readme file. So this is the information that will be shown once you have generated an application. So first step, we have created the Docker file. Now it's to tag the images and then push it. So let's go ahead and tag the first image. Let's go and do it here. So I'm creating an image tag of DevOps UK 2018 under my repository, Sandal Kumar and slash DevOps UK 2018. And then I'm pushing it here. Let me go and do the same for app service. So I'm tagging the image and then pushing the image. So what will happen here is like this entire image will be moved to my repository and from there you can see it. Once you have done this thing, then you have to run all those three commands. Like these three commands will help you to deploy the registry, the DevOps UK uh, 2018 that is a gateway and the app service into the JAPS Kubernetes server that we have the GCP Kubernetes cluster that we have generated. I'll show you that too in a while. But also you can do this in a single command because we have the script file that is generated. This does this thing for you. So you just have to run the script file which makes it easier for you. So let's go ahead and see how it works. So image is getting pushed over there. Let me go here. So this is an application that we are going to deploy. We have a Kubernetes cluster that has been generated in my GCP profile. So you have this cluster that is running here. So all we have to do is just to push the images to this cluster. So I already connected the cluster. You have to connect the cluster in your local repository from your local machine. So you have to use this command to connect it. I've already done it, which means I'm ready to go now if the images are pushed. Okay, images are getting pushed. In the meanwhile, I can show you this demo stuff that I have. So here, this is a cluster that I'm talking about. And if you go inside and check, uh, this is an image that I've created just before this demo. We'll wait till the image is getting pushed. I'll show you a quick demo because we have eight more minutes left. So you have this, you can see it here, you have the gateway application that is generated. You have gateway MySQL, that is your database. And then the jhipster, which is your application service, microservice service. And this is a jhipster MySQL, that is a MySQL database for the, your microservice. And then you have this jhipster registry that is up and running. So let's go ahead and see. So this is a registry that is running on the cloud. So if you can see, it's on the cloud on jhipster on GCP. So here you can see, like I said, like there are two jhipster registries that are registered. Both of them are uh, highly available, which helps you to, if one goes down, the other part will, uh, cook, will kick in and it will start the JAPSTER registry again. And then it also shows the entire configuration that I have, you have seen just before. So it shows the metrics of the application that is running on the cloud and all those information. And this is this application that has been generated. So here, if you go ahead and see, it has JAPSTER registry and JAPSTER, which is a microservice application that is running. It's very similar, but you can see it here, I'm running out of the cloud. Okay, it's going on, it's getting to almost finish. So just before that, one quick announcement. We do have JXPTO conference that is coming on June 21. It's happening on Paris. You can see lots and lots of Java rock stars there. <laughs> Great, any questions so far before we conclude this talk and I push this image and show it to you? Any questions so far? We do have modules that support Vue.js, and we do have, if Vue.js is getting more and more attraction, we are trying to add it in the default generator that is half, but right now we can use 
uh, modules that will help you to generate Vue.js based front end. If uh, I would, I would generally do a, sing, a microservice that is generated by JHipster, a microservice application, and I have my gateway. This gateway remains there, and I just use this JHipster-based microservice application to generate a microservice. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I think this is awesome, by the way. It's really good. Thank uh, you. OK, exactly. So this is another classic question that we always get. Uh, so what we actually, there are two kinds, two different approaches that we have. The first approach is uh, jhipster actually produces an entire set of application, the configuration bean, and everything for you. So you can just leave those things apart and write your custom code. Like if you want to override a bean configuration, extend it and write it as a different file. Because which means that when I do upgrade, you do have jhipster upgrade command, which helps you to upgrade the entire application. But when you, when you do some changes to the application that we have generated, we look at it and we say, OK, this is a file that has been changed. You want to override it. You want to create, uh, move this, everything. Like You have to find the difference between the files, and you do merge by yourself. So we do provide that option. But ideally, I would suggest like you go ahead and extend all those stuffs, write your custom configuration there. And you can use that everywhere. Like tomorrow, if you if we are moving from Spring Boot one to Spring Boot two, and uh, we we are already in Spring Boot two, of course, but we are moving from another version to the new version, or Angular, we move to Angular five to Angular six. Then, if you haven't touched the files that has been generated by us, then it's much more easier for you to upgrade. The upgrade process is much more happier for you. That's it. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, let me check. Yes, it's already there, but we have removed the Facebook because uh, it's like merely 0.5% of people who are using Facebook authentication and also Spring Social Facebook has some problem in it. So we don't have Facebook support, but we do have social configuration, Spring Social, but Spring Social. Yeah, it's pushed. So let's go ahead and see. Not this. Let's go ahead and run kubectl apply. So you can see it will try to push all those images inside. It creates the configuration, it creates a secret, and then creates the JPS registry, and all those stuffs that we have seen so far. And you can see here the application is deployed in the cloud right now, and it's available. It's getting booting up, so it might take a few minutes, but it will be available sooner. And the application that you're going to see is similar to what you have. So with one command, jhipster Kubernetes, you have everything generated. You just create your Docker image and push it to the cloud. That's it. Simple, easier, easy microservices. OK, any more questions? We have three minutes left. Yeah, please. Of course, yeah, you can do that. Uh, so all the application, all the things that we are generating will have this file, which we call it as urcjson. So this is a file that you're talking about, if I remember correctly. So it has all the values that has been generated. It has everything inside. You just pass this file and then put it in a folder and then say, uh, say your users or everybody who's using to type jhipster command, it creates an entire file again for you. And you do have a start jhipster.tech, which is similar to start spring.io. Uh, it helps you to generate your application with all the bundle and operation combinations that you have in a much nicer and cleaner UI. And we do have JDL, and I think that's worth uh, another session for that. But it helps you to create entities for you, and it also helps you to create an application itself from a list of a text file that you can create all by yourself. So you support working with encrypted configuration as well? Yes. Okay. So no more questions? Okay. Happy hacking. Enjoy. Thank you. Okay.